So the first question we have is from Mbugelo Fibonacci. Thank you so much for all your questions. I must say, in every episode that we've had, Mr. Fibonacci has been so consistent with all the questions that he sends through. So the question that he sends through today says, the possible energy levels that an electron of a hydrogen atom can occupy within a hydrogen atom and the line emission spectrum that hydrogen gives as observed in the hydrogen gas discharge it tube is given below. So this is the tube that they're talking about. Now remember, here they've given us a diagram. In this diagram here, we have energy levels. We've got energy level one, two, three, all the way to six, and then infinity. And then on the side, we've got some numbers. Measuring it in joules means that is the energy that is required. Now, remember when we start with the photoelectric effect, it's all about electrons being emitted. They must be emitted with enough kinetic energy so they can actually start moving around. But we also know that these electrons are actually emitted from different types of metals, right? That's what the photoelectric effect is all about. But then again, electrons can actually absorb or then emit absorption and emission spectrum. Now, the whole thing with the table that they've given us says, when an electron moves from one energy level to another energy level, it requires energy. Think of yourself going up the staircase. If you had to go up to two staircases, nah, not so bad. But if you had a hundred staircases, you're gonna need a lot of energy, right? So take electrons as the same way. For them to keep moving up an energy level, it requires energy, right? But now we also know when electrons need to be emitted and so forth, we have to take things like the work function, which is the, the, in terms of the metal, we have to also take in charge the brightness that is given, the threshold frequency, the energy that the electron will have, and so forth, as well as the brightness of the light. So now, always keep that in the back of your mind. So let's see what the question says. So it says here, for the electron transition of energy level 6 to 2, we must calculate the following. So we are only going to work with 6 and 2. That is a, that is a, a clue that you're given. Also know that this diagram here is not just for show, you are going to be asked something about it. Number one says we must calculate the energy release, the energy of a released photoelectron, only with six and two. So now what the examiner wants to see, they want to know that you know that there's change in energy. So for the first one, they're asking us for energy level six to energy level two. Now it just means you need to subtract. Remember when we did momentum, vertical, projectile motion, and stuff like that, you always take final minus initial. So it's the same thing that we're doing here. From six to two, we're gonna take six minus the energy level of two, and then we are able to find the change in energy that's occurring there. So let's just double check the numbers at the top. So we have six, remember it is a negative, two is also a negative, do not remove the negatives. So in this case, mathematics, you must put it in brackets, and then you must also um, calculate it. So energy level six is negative, negative 0 0.61 times 10 to the negative 19, close my bracket. It is a negative, is a negative, because we are subtracting. However, energy level two is also a negative, which is 5.45 times 10 to the negative 19. So now let's see what we're gonna get there. Put it exactly as it is on your calculator. So I've got negative 0 0.61 times 10 to the exponent negative 19, negative 19, bring down my bracket, minus, open another bracket, minus 5.45 times 10 to the exponent negative 19, negative 19. Let's bring that down. Let's see what our answer is gonna be. So I get 4.84 times 10 to the exponent, negative 19. So my answer is 4.84 times 10 to the negative 19. Remember, when we are calculating energy, the SI unit for energy is in joules. So that's question number one. We have now calculated the change between six and two. Now let's see what the other question says. Question number two says, the wavelength of the radiated light in nanometer. Now remember, the examiners, when they talk about nanometer, picometer, kilo, and all that stuff, they're only talking about conversion factors. Now from grade 9 and grade 10, we were learned or we were taught how to convert from one SI unit to the next. For an example, in South Africa, when we're talking about a distance that you walk, we usually use meters. In other countries, they use things like miles and so forth. But in us, in South Africa, we say kilometers or meters, giving length and so forth. So when we 
we have to convert or moving from conversion factors, the examiner wants to see whether you know how to convert from one to another. Now, something tricky about conversion factors is the fact that they do not give them to you in your exam or in your formula sheet. So it is something that you must know off by heart. So in this case, they are telling us we must calculate the wavelength of the radiated light in nanometer. Now, we've already found the change in energy, which happened over here. Now we can find wavelength. Now, when we find wavelength, we must use, we must use a formula that allows us to use energy and then find our wavelength. So I'm going to show you how I'm going to break it down for question number two. Now we know when we talk about energy, we can say E is equal to HF. This is a standard um, formula that we know. However, if we had to, for example, find, because now they're looking for the frequency, I must make F the subject of the formula. I divide both sides by F. I'm going to have F is equal to E over H. Remember, H is a constant that they do give to you. So the energy that we got, I'm going to use the energy that I got here. Now, another thing that you must remember, hypothetically speaking, let's say for question number one, I had an answer that had maybe seven decimal uh, places. Always remember to round it off to two decimal places, right? In this case, it was already in two decimal places, so we're going to keep it like that. But in, in case it wasn't, make sure that you round it off and moving on to the next question, use the answer that you've rounded off, continuous assessment. So now we find the energy. So the energy is that I have is 4.84 times 10 to the negative 19. H is a constant, which is 6.63. Let me just erase that, which is 6.63. There we are. So 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34, to the negative 34. Now let's put that in a calculator. Now remember, if ever you're given something with so many exponents and so forth, make sure that you actually put it in brackets. So at the top, I've got my 4.84 times 10 to the exponent negative 19. Take down my bracket. At the bottom, I've got the constant, which is 6.63 times 10 to the exponent negative 34. Bring that down. And then I get 7.3. I'm going to leave it to two decimal places. So that's 30015. So the zero is less than five. So it does not change the other number. So I'm just going to have 7.30 times 10 to the exponent 14. So the answer that I'm going to have here for the frequency of the wavelength, I'm going to have 7.30 times 10 to the 14. Now, frequency has an SI unit, which is hertz. Now remember, the important thing about using SI units or actually indicating to say uh, it's, it's hertz, it's meters per second, it's kilograms and so forth, so the examiner knows what you are actually talking about. I mean, if Mbali walked in here and I said, Mbali, uh, 51, Mbali could say 51 marshmallows, 51 strawberries or what? I could be saying 51 grams, 51 minutes, and so forth. So by you indicating an SI unit, you are showing the examiner that you know what's going on. And remember, you do actually get marks for indicating the SI unit. Remember, the SI unit needs to correspond with the formula that you have used, that you have actually used. So show the examiner that you know what's going on. You get a mark for your formula, for substituting, plugging in, getting your correct answer, and using the correct SI unit. And also remember, if something is a vector or a scalar, in, in terms of vectors, make sure that you actually always give a direction. So for, the, for, so for number two, we were looking for the frequency, and that's the frequency that we are given. Now let's see. Let's see what the other question says. So no, they wanted us to calculate the wavelength. So now we found the frequency, so we are continuing on. I'm just going to work here on the side. So now that I have frequency, I know that we have a formula that says C is equal to F lambda. I'm looking for my wavelength in nanometer. To find lambda by itself, I'm going to divide both sides by F. So I'm going to have lambda will give me C over frequency. Now lambda, or the C actually is the speed of light, so that is a constant. So that is 3 times 10 to the exponent 8. I have worked out the frequency, so that is 7.30 times 10 to the exponent 14. So now let's calculate what is the land, and they said they want it in nanometer. So it's also a fraction. Put brackets around always, 10, 3 times 10 to the exponent 8. Bring that down. At the bottom, 
I've got 7.30 times 10 to the exponent 14. So let's see what we have. So I'm going to press that button there that says we must change. And then this is how my answer looks. So I'm going to write it down, but they said they want it in nanometer. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 zeros there. So I've got 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 6, and that is for 1. They want it in nanometer. So now I'm going to move my comma. I'm going to say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Put an imaginary 0 there, and that is 9. Remember, nanometer is times 10 to the negative 9. So then I can say this will be 4, 1, 0 times 10 to the negative 9, which then shows that it's nanometer. Now, the SI unit that we use for lambda is meters. So I'm just going to leave it a nanometer and then give that an SI unit, which is then meters. So that is question number two. They wanted us to find the wavelength, but the tricky thing here is that we first had to use the energy formula, and from finding the energy, we needed to find the frequency. From the frequency, we had to know that if I've got frequency, I'm able to find my wavelength. That's the... that's what we had to do. Let's look at the last question. And then they're saying, which color light is radiated when the electron makes this transition? Now, we, what we need to do is, now we've already found the wavelength, right? We found it in the previous question. We have the wavelength is four zero times 10 to the negative nine. Now, this is what we were given. So we've got um, wavelength here, which is 6.63 nanometer, then four, 429 nanometer, then 438 nanometer, then I've got 410 nanometer. This color right here is not very clear to me, but let's say, let's go with red. I think it looks more red. So that is the color that you'll give. In this case, I'm not gonna say any color because I really can't see, but looking at the nanometer that we got in this question, that will be the color that you're looking for. So because my picture's not clear, I'm just gonna say hypothetically speaking, um, just move on to this one. So the third one, the color, the color that we have was the color red that was radiated. Remember, I'm not very sure what color is that, but that is then how you had to tackle that one.